So um, Steve Kyle uh, did Acts 16 last week, uh, 16A and 16B. And so we're going to be uh, continuing on through the book of Acts. Um, and mainly what we're looking, looking at here is uh, Paul's missionary journey and some of the other disciples that uh, uh, were chosen to uh, continue on with the gospel. Uh, and so Paul in uh, 17 is going to be uh, continuing on his, this will be the second journey. And he's going to uh, go into towns called uh, Apollo Apollonius, Athens, and Thessalonica, and uh, a couple other places. And so uh, we're going to be looking at tonight um, kind of what he always does, basically, is going into the synagogues and just sharing the gospel. Um, I find this portion of the scripture a little bit interesting um, because I kind of like to know a lot of the different philosophies of people that I talk to. And so this is kind of where I see where Paul does that as well. So it kind of gets into some of the old Greek philosophies and stuff like that. And talking to uh, uh, Epicurus, Stoic, Stoicism, and, and things like that, I find kind of inter interesting because you never know what other people think and you know, what kind of background they come from. And so you kind of have to be able to listen and engage that conversation in order to have a if I'm an educated conversation, but at least an interesting conversation. So um, with that, we'll go ahead and uh, pray, and then we'll get started. Again, that's going to be in Acts 17. We're going to be covering um, chapters 1 through 14 tonight. And I'll get my Bible, so let's pray. So God, thank you so much uh, for this evening. Uh, we thank you for your son Jesus, Father, most importantly, who has uh, stepped out of, out of time, Father brought us uh, salvation. And so we thank you uh, for that gift, God, that we can uh, open up uh, and, and celebrate on a daily basis. So tonight, uh, Father, being no different, uh, we're able to come together uh, and discuss you, uh, to draw closer to you, and uh, we thank you for that, dear God. There are a lot of places in the world, Father, who don't have that opportunity. Uh, we have opportunities. Sometimes we just take that for granted, God, that we can just come together and just study the Bible and speak freely where okay? a lot of brothers are dying God, just to read a page or one note uh, from your word, God, just to serve you as their Savior, God, dying. Just. And so, God, thank you. Um, I ask that you would just uh, keep them protected wherever they are. May we be better servants, Father, in that cause. Um, I know that someday, God, our time is going to come. And so, God, we ask that we be prepared for that time. And we stand strong in that time. And uh, be one with you in the resurrection. So thank you again for this evening. In Jesus' name I pray. Everybody say amen. amen. So. Yeah, man. So we ain't gonna we in verse seventeen. We're gonna start this talk. We're gonna do about forty minutes. Um, and so if you wanna um, read along with me, I'm gonna be reading from the New Living Translation. Um, I like that one. Plus, this is the uh, they have these in the bookstore. I'm not sure if you have a copy. This is the um, the Study Bible, and I like it because um, you're able to kind of read the notes to go along with it. Because a lot of times. Um, these scriptures, man, uh, you kind of want to know. I think one of my brother, Steve Cobb, he ever heard him. He likes uh, the timeline, man. And this Bible kind of gives you that timeline. Um, and so you can kind of um, piece it together and know exactly where you are uh, in time and you know, what was happening during that time and who was there and all of that good stuff. So, speaking of the devil, here he comes. And so, um, in verse 17, we'll go ahead and begin reading from that area. And here's the, the Bible, not the Bible, but the, um, 
the map. They had these on sale also in the bookstore. And this is uh, going to be Paul's uh, second journey. He's going to be going up here to uh, the Nike. You might want to keep guys having seen it. You know, Steve kind of has a big map that he puts on the board. You guys want to look at it. It's the second mission of the journey. And so, again, so in verse in chapter 17, it says, Paul and Silas then traveled through the towns of Amph Amphipolis and Apollonia and came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was Paul's custom, he went to the synagogue service uh, for three Sabbaths in a row. He used the scriptures to reason with the people. He explained the prophecies and proved that the Messiah must suffer and rise from the dead. He said, this is Jesus, this Jesus I am telling you about is the Messiah. I'm just going to read all the way through uh, 14. And then some of the Jews who listened were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, along with many God-fearing Greek men and quite a few prominent women. But some of the Jews were jealous, so they gathered some troublemakers from the marketplace to form a mob and started riot. They attacked the home of Jason, searching for Paul and Silas so they could drag them out to the crowd. And not finding them there, they dragged out Jason and some of the other believers instead and took them before the city council. Paul and Silas had caused trouble all over the world, they shouted. And now they are disturbing our city too. And in verse 7 it says, and Jason has welcomed them into his home. They are all guilty of treason against Caesar. And for the prophets, nor for they profess allegiance to another king named Jesus. And the people, the people of the city as well as the, the city council were thrown into turmoil by these reports. So the officials forced Jason and the other believers to post bond. And then they released them. In verse 10, that very night the believers sent Paul and Silas to Berea, where they arrived. They went to the Jewish synagogue, and the people of Berea were, open, were more open-minded than those in Thessalonica, and they listened eagerly to Paul's message. So they searched the scriptures day after day to see if Paul and Silas were teaching the truth. And as a result, many Jews believed as did many of the prominent Greek women and men. But when some Jews in Thessalonica learned that Paul was preaching the word of, of God in Berea, they went there and stirred up trouble. And then 14, the believers acted at once, sending Paul to, onto the coast, while Silas and Timothy remained behind. And those escorting Paul went with him all the way to Athens. Then they returned to Berea with instructions for Silas and Timothy to hurry and join him. This last part of that uh, verse is pretty interesting too, but this is kind of where uh, Paul left Timothy behind to basically um, start the church of Thessalonica. And so that's an interesting topic when you begin to read um, Paul's, uh, basically I think that's the oldest letter, uh, the first letter based to uh, the church of Thessalonica. Uh, you'll see where Paul they were kind of, kind of not complaining, but he kind of had to start the church and then he had to leave. And he was never able to return, but he wanted to return. But then that's a whole nother story about the devil uh, restraining him from going back. And so we, we'll talk about that when we get uh, to that portion. But um, tonight, uh, one of the main um, topics here that I found to be really interesting or important for us uh, again, we only have uh, so much time to really delve into this. Um, is really that, you know, we notice that Paul, as always, is going to uh, the synagogue. So he's going, no matter where he is, you know, he's going to always go to the synagogue. He's going to always go somewhere and preach the gospel. And as we know, um, there were lots of Jewish believers. There weren't, uh, there were some non-believers, but uh, the Jewish community, um, they uh, worship, not worship, but they were mainly with the law, Moses, the law of Moses. And so Paul goes into the synagogue, and then he begins to reason. Um, and one of the notes that 
the Bible says here that he reasoned, uh, he explained the prophecies and proved that the Messiah must suffer uh, from the dead. And so I like those words. He reasoned, he explained, and so my question uh, for myself would be, you know, if I was in that situation, like I'm, no, like we all are normally, you know, then what do you use to explain to non-believers the scripture? And that's what the Bible says here. It says Paul used scripture to explain uh, to those believers or non-believers in the synagogue about the resurrection. That's mainly what we're talking about here is the resurrection. You know, so um, depending on some of the literature that you're reading, you know, there are a lot of things that tell us that basically there were uh, 29, basically 29 prophecies that Christ fulfilled within a 24 hour period. 29. Uh, we have some of those um, scriptures that we can go over, but 29 prophecies within that 24 hour period. And so no doubt Paul being a man uh, of study, knew the Hebrew scriptures, and I would, I would always wonder, I mean, what do you use? You know, when you're going into battle, we'll use that term, when you're going into the battlefield or you're going into an area or territory that you don't know what people are, believers or non-believers, what do you use? Do you have ammunition to go into the fight? Or do you just go there hoping and praying that uh, you'll have something, or that you'll be able to say something intelligent, or be hoping and praying that you don't say something stupid that will drive the um, non-believer away? You know, so as men um, here at the bridge, you know, it's important that, you know, when we're talking to individuals from that come to visit or we're talking to uh, some of the young men that are coming in or that are here at our church, you know, that uh, for me, I'm always, uh, I do more listening than I do talking. Uh, it's rare for me to sit up here and talk right now. But, you know, but I do, I do more listening uh, because I always allow for the Holy Spirit to speak to me to let me know what it is that this person is really asking, what they're really saying, or what it is that God has anything for me to even share. So if he doesn't have anything for me to share, then you know, I don't say anything at all. Um, so here we have Paul who is uh, in the synagogue. I'm not sure what he was sharing. Of course, I know he's sharing about the resurrection, but I wonder if he's going about, because you know in Acts 9 and 3, that's when Paul actually was converted, right? We read that in the earlier studies, right? So in this same, um, same men's Bible study, the book of Acts, Paul actually had his conversion. You know, in Acts 9, he was going to um, Damascus and he was asking for letters from the high priest to be able to go to the synagogue to bring back those people who are of the way. And however, Right? So this is what's his mission, and on that road to Damascus, he got slapped down right? on his way to do damage. But then he was converted in the, in the same. So this was, uh, what does it say, 30, around 45, right, Steve, something like that? 45? Yeah, for Paul's conversion, 36, right? So this is not long after, you know, and so, here he is now in the synagogue. Right? He, he's preaching or sharing the gospel with men who have been studying the word for a long time. You know, and he's by himself. He has a uh, couple of buddies with him. But he doesn't have the whole church. He doesn't have the Sanhedrin. He doesn't have, you know, those. Uh, he has a bunch of Sadducees in front of him that he's trying to convince of the resurrection. You know, these people don't believe in the resurrection. And they like, man, no, it, it, it doesn't exist. So, so what is he sharing? Is he sharing his conversion on the road to Damascus? I don't know. I mean, I'm just asking. It's a good question, right? Or, um, he could be. Or, I would think that 
if he's talking to these people who are well learned, that he would be using the Hebrew scriptures to show them that, hey man, this Jesus who was resurrected has already been prophesied about in the scripture. This is him. This was him. And so he used the scripture uh, to, to convince them of that. And so, so for you and for I, it's important that we um, stay abreast to the scripture. Did I miss up? Oh, man. Hold on. Uh, so we got the reason explained and he demonstrated through the scripture. So based on the scripture, who is Jesus, the Messiah? There are lots of scriptures um, giving us that. And so in this city, remember that um, in Thessalonica, these, these folks had their own um, poly polytheistic society. So they believed in many gods, right? So you'll see later in this, in this chapter where Paul is addressing this issue uh, that you know, there are so many gods in Athens. I want to talk to you to one that you don't have a label for. So, so, here's some of the dates for Acts. And so, this is when uh, AD uh, 31, 34, Paul is persecuting the church of Judea. And this is at the same time that the emperor Claudius is expelling, ex expelled the Jews from Rome. So, this, he wrote um, the book to the church of Thessalonians in about 50 AD from Corinth, right? And so, about a year after that, he's, he's writing this letter to these people at Thessalonica. And then he writes uh, 2 Thessalonians um, in 51. And so, well, some of the Jews were jealous, so they gathered uh, some troublemakers from the marketplace to form a mob and start a riot. They attacked the home of Jason, one of the <coughs> searching for Paul and Silas, so they dragged them out to the crowd. What I want to point out here, um, when you keep reading, uh, it says Paul and Silas have caused trouble all over the world and they shot it and now they are disturbing our city too. And seven, it said, and Jason was welcomed, uh, welcomed them into his home. They are all guilty of treason against Caesar for, their, for they profess allegiance to another king named Jesus. Now, this may come... Uh, to some of y'all or some of us where it came to me as a shock, you know. When we're um, uh, atheists, right? so uh, we all have our own idea of what atheism is or modern atheism, right? And so uh, some of the literature there begins to speak about atheism as uh, God not existing at all. That's what we refer to as modern atheism. Um, but in this sense, uh, these individuals or the people of the way, if you read that very closely, it says they are guilty of treason against Caesar for they profess allegiance to another king named Jesus. So as we hear from the platform a lot, you know, is that they didn't mind you worshiping more than one God. But if you worship just one God, or Jesus, you were considered to be a troublemaker. And they used that term as being an atheist. It was way before modern atheism. That's just a food for thought. So you can kind of have some history. Uh, if you want to read about it, that's fine. If not, you know, I just thought it was interesting because... Now, I wanted to know what atheism was, exactly, you know, um, and some of the history. Um, and basically, where it came, where modern atheism comes from is, you know, uh, the oppression of the church. The church um, basically just oppressing its people, controlling its people. And so the, the, uh, the people decided to break away from the church. And so they thought that that would be Yes, they refer to as socialism at this point. And so um, that's how, that's kind of in a nutshell. Um, of course, that is not as um, prominent now 
as it was back when the um, East and West Berlin were prominent and the fall of the um, Berlin Wall. Uh, a lot of that came tumbling down when a lot of people from the East began to filter over into the West. And so um, it's interesting to, to know and to read about how that European train of thought moved over into the Western culture. Um, and it was all based upon uh, re removing yourselves from the church. Uh, and so, all right. So, let me get back to my notes here. Interesting stuff, man. The study of the scripture, man, is interesting, to say the least. Um, and so, again, Paul, referring to uh, the resurrection, these are some of my notes, so uh, I didn't print them out, so you guys are uh, basically getting to see my cheat sheet. Mm -hmm. And so, again, um, what is the reason how you reason from the scripture? So, again, it's important that um, you always, uh, when you're talking to somebody that's an unbeliever, or even if you're talking to somebody that's uh, a church goer, you know, that you base your conversation on scripture and on scripture alone. But I find that when you try to, um, it, I say this, there are a lot of people who go to church who, uh, uh, including us, you know, there's some, we got to leave here, they can quote scripture and quote it, in the, you know, they, you know, but to be able to really um, understand what it's saying and having a conversation. So, for example, if Adam and I were having a conversation about about scripture, or we were having a conversation about the, uh, whatever, you know, and so we, I would say to Adam, well, you know, scripturally, you know, that's not a good move, you know? and Adam would say, well, the Bible would say, <laughs> the Bible don't say that, the Bible says this, you know, and then you say, well, that's not what it really says, you know? You read the whole thing, it's not what it's talking about. That's what I mean by having a scriptural conversation. You know, you're really basing it upon, you're basing your, for lack of a better word, your philosophy, or you're basing your thought process upon what the scriptures are actually saying. Um, I think I see Mr. Miles sitting here, and, and I see some of his Facebook posts sometimes, man, and, and uh, you can, when you read them, you can really think, look at it and think, really put a lot of thought into that. You know, it's not just a, one of them things, I'm hit you and gone. No, it's, it's very, it's very thought provoking and it allows you to really to kind of stop and kind of look at the perspective of where, he, where, he, where he's bringing the information from. And then I think that's a good thing because I, um, just like Paul reasoning from the scripture, you're able, he's not, he's, you're able to kind of make up your own mind, which he allowed the people in the synagogue to do. Because when we keep reading, it says they came to be believers based upon the reasoning and the explanation and the demonstration from the scripture, they all, they, women and children or men came to be believers. So, so we have here um, another example. Um, uh, let's see. Paul says that this Jesus I preach to you is the Christ. And this should be our philosophy as well. And so we have this example here that Jesus himself, his reasoning, his word reason comes back up. On the road to Emmaus after his uh, uh, burial where the, uh, the women go down to the tomb to see that he's not there. And then you have uh, the angels asking them the question, why are you searching for the living? Why are you searching, what it was, why are you searching for the the dead in the land of the living. And so we have these two who are walking down this road. He says, then he said to them, speaking of Jesus, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe 
and all that the prophets have spoken. Again, the prophets have already spoken in the Hebrew Scripture. Remember, they didn't have the New Testament at this point. Ought uh, not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So even Jesus, you know, went back to the beginning with the prophet Moses, began to explain to him how the Christ had to suffer and die. So I would assume that Paul did the same thing. He, he, there's no other way he could have done it because, like I said, there was no, uh, <laughs> there was no New Testament at that point. You, know, he had to, either you knew it or you didn't know it. Uh, Pastor David has been, uh, or had recently re, uh, referred to or stopped referring to the Old Testament as the Old Testament and started using the term Hebrew Scriptures. I think that's appropriate because in it, if you're reading it, is a lot of history. I mean, a lot of history. A lot of history about a lot of different cultures. And so if you're interested in learning how to share the gospel with people of different cultures, I would highly suggest that you read the Hebrew scriptures um, and get to know uh, some of these things. I've talked to a lot of people, maybe going off topic a little bit, um, how, you, how you had that discussion. Um, I have a lot of friends that are um, of the um, what they call the uh, progressive movement. They use that term, um, and so they uh, see things a bit different than a lot of us do. Um, and it has its connotations and uh, uh, reasoning. But uh, for the most part, um, they don't necessarily accept Christ as their Savior because they don't like him being depicted or they don't depict it as a white guy. Um, and so they have, there's an issue with them crossing over or accepting the fact of that. You can't be that. So, um, so we had this conversation about the, um, uh, you know, whatever it is. You know. um, but the point being is that if you read the scripture um, and you see where all of this originated, then you know that the people there were, were you know, so um, they were people of color. And so, and so we had this conversation, but yet and still, you know, the scripture, Jesus is the savior of the world. You know, he came out of the tribe of Judah. And so when you're reasoning with people who have this uh, difficulty in making that leap or this blinder to uh, making that being the only thing that stops them from believing in Christ, then you have to reason with them from the scripture. Right? And you can't go back on that. And so from the scripture, and so again, the philosophy of uh, Thessalonica being that of many different gods. And so the people that I'm talking about, they have this uh, same philosophy. They have uh, it being many different gods, you know, and that you can uh, pick and choose uh, the scripture or any scripture that you deem to be necessary to... Um, make your philosophy true, you know? And so, um, and, and my, my whole conversation is, well, you can't just pick and choose what you want. You, you can't just pick and choose. You know, either, either, either the Bible is for you or it's not for you. Either the word of God is true for you or it's not true for you. You can't just pick and choose what you want out of it 
to, to make your point. So, so uh, that's kind of where we get off on that conversation. And so, so it says here, the angel of the grave, uh, the gravesite of Christ, asked the believers, and as they were afraid and bowed down their face to the earth, it said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? So Christ is arisen. So if you're a believer, the main thing when you're sharing the gospel is the resurrection. You have to always keep that up front. It's the resurrection because the other scripture says if, if the resurrection isn't true, then we're all doing this in vain. We're all doing this for nothing. So it's the resurrection. We have plenty of scriptures that point that out. Um, and so we turn to Hebrews 10, 11 to through 23, you guys want to read along with me. We'll cover a few things here. How much time we got? I know like it probably sounds like I'm rambling, but it's a, there's a lot of information that I have that I'm trying to um, trying to squeeze in here, but what's happening? Are you going to read it to me? Go ahead, man. 10, 11 through 23. Uh, yeah. So it says, under the old covenant, the priest stands and ministers before the altar day and after, day after day, offering the same sacrifices again and again, which can never uh, take away sins. But our high priest offered himself to God as a single sacrifice of sins and good for all time. So the reason why I'm covering this is because, remember, in the, in the synagogue where they practiced the law, this is what they were practicing. They were practicing the, the sacrifices. And so Paul is trying to lead them. I'm not sure if Paul is the author here, but he's trying to lead them away from the sacrifices and that the blood of Christ is all that we need. And so uh, in verse uh, 4, it says, For it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. And that is why when Christ came to the world, he said to God, You did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings, but you have given me a body to offer. You were not pleased with burnt offerings or other offerings for sin. Then I said, Look, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written about me, in the scriptures, again, referring back to the Hebrew scriptures, uh, this is the quote from Jesus, all right? and that will be found. I got it written down here. Psalms 40, 6 through 8, if you want to go back and read that for yourself. All right. And so. This is Paul's uh, Damascus Road experience. I did explain his conversion. This is his, if you want to read that, that's his conversion. Or did he use, uh, did he, or did he tell them, this is my other example, in 1 Corinthians, where he says, I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Or in Ephesians 3 and 8, to me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentile, the Gentile, the unsearchable riches of Christ. And this is something that we can all uh, grasp a hold of because uh, we were all sinners when Christ came into our lives. Paul was on his way to the road uh, to Damascus when Christ came into his life. Uh, I was watching a movie this week, man. It was kind of interesting. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen that movie, uh, Lucy, anybody ever seen? Never? Okay. Hanson. May have. What's her name? Scarlett Johansson? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And um, uh, I, ha I had seen it before, um, but uh, as I was sitting, my wife and I went to the mountains this weekend, and they had HBO, so I was kind of like this. Um, but as I was watching it, um, Toward the end, um, she made a statement, um, and it was based, it was talking about time, um, and that um, time, don't quote me this, you can look at it, it's on time.
time gives uh, existence to matter. Basically that if you have, a, if you have something um, like a car, you can see the car, and if you sped up the car the time so fast, at some point the car would disappear. It would be like off the screen, basically. And that time gives that uh, car its importance. So if you slow down the time, you'll be able to see the car. So basically what it's saying is that if human, human beings have uh, reduced everything to its smallest capacity or its uh, least common denominator where you can basically understand basically one plus one equals two. And so really one plus one does really equal two. You, you have to look at this here. But anyway, it's not true. Um, it's not, the reason why I say that is because if you look at those movies, right, and they say things, and you kind of like, you, how does that work, you know? But, and I was preparing my lesson for tonight, and I said, that, how, does, how does that work? And I began to pray, and the scripture came to my mind was that God's word became flesh. And basically, what, it's, what I'm saying is God stepped into time. He stepped into existence out of his word. So the, I think the scripture says that um, uh, what does it say? Time didn't, did not exist before God created the universe. So when God created the universe, time began. Right? So otherwise, there was no time before that. And so God stepped into the universe. And John 1 and 14 says God's word became flesh. So God exists outside of time. And so here we are now having to measure, basically, the existence of Christ based on time. Right? And so, as I said earlier, Jesus fulfilled 24 scriptures in a matter of 24 hours, or 29 scriptures in a matter of 24 hours. That's unheard of. You have people who say, um, he arranged all of that. There's no way, as Pastor P.D. says from the stage, you can't, you can't arrange where you're born. You can't arrange who your parents are, uh, and a host of a lot of other things that you just can't arrange, you know, in order to make that uh, make that happen. And so, if you're, I think, um, and I, I'm, I'm blessed with Pastor Nick too. I'm glad he's here. When I first came here, he gave me a book, um, and he, he probably doesn't remember, but uh, uh, it's called. The, I don't think that was the book, but. I used to read this book on the bus to Winston-Salem. I didn't know what it was in the beginning, but it's called Evidence for Christianity. Um, I think it was, they, they did the uh, college study here. Um, and I was new to the faith. And so I wanted to know exactly, man. And so I've had it now for eight, nine years probably, right? Um, and so, but just to give you a few uh, scriptures of, uh, of prophecy, uh, that Paul would probably have used to explain it. Here's one of them prophecies. He said, For you will not leave my soul in shield, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. And that's in Psalms 16 and 10. Uh, that was David. And the, and the uh, fulfillment of that prophecy we see here in Matthew 28 and 6. He is not here, for he has risen, just as he said. Come, see the place where he was lying. And that's in Matthew 28 and 6, we saw earlier where the angel asked him, why were they looking in this place for the living? You know, so here we have this prophecy being fulfilled. Again, this is just uh, a couple of those, man. Um, I have quite a few. But uh, his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his uh, flesh see corruption. Uh, you can find that in Acts 2 and 31. And then here, uh, in Psalms 41 and 9, uh, Jeremiah 20, these all match up to Matthew 10 and 4. You just write these down. Zechariah 11 and 12. 
uh, matches up with Matthew 26 and 15. Again, these are just a few that I thought would be appropriate because we are, these are all speaking of the resurrection of Christ. And so we see that um, the study, uh, Pastor David has challenged some of the leadership, the study of uh, hermeneutics, man. You know, why do you believe what you believe? You know, why do you believe that? Why do you um, uh, follow Christ? Uh, he's your savior. But if somebody were to ask you, um, what is your, uh, why do you follow Jesus? What would you tell them? What scripture would you use, you know, to back that up? Or even if you weren't speaking to anyone about it, you know, how do you convince yourself? If I were to ask you to write a paper, right, how would you explain that? Why do you believe in the deity of Christ? This was his question to me, Pastor David. Please include what Jesus said about himself, what others said about Jesus. And the second one, why do you believe in the divine inspiration of Scripture? You might want to write this down. Because, I tell you, if you ever talk to Pastor David, this is what he's going to ask you. Because you have to be able to explain this. You have to be able to answer these questions for yourself. I mean, because it's important. You just can't walk around. None of us can just walk around and just say, Christ is my Savior, and not know why. You understand what I'm saying? You have, there has to be a reason. You have to, if you're not studying the scripture to make this true to you or to be a Berean and digging this stuff out, then I, I think that Christ would probably say to all of us, he said, I, I never knew you. I, I never knew you. You, you. you didn't even take the time to even search me out. You just follow along with everybody else. You, know? and you never really even knew who I was. So why do you believe in the divine inspiration of Scripture? There are some, some, I read something this weekend, somebody says, what was I reading? Uh, this, uh, uh, you ever heard of the word Yahwehism? Yahwehism, right? Another philosophy, right? Jewish philosophy, uh, where as um, they talk about Paul, not being uh, a disciple, right? uh, and that he was not one of the chosen twelve, and so they had their own philosophy. They uh, more lean towards the law uh, and not the synoptic <coughs> gospels, and so. Um, <laughs> anyway. So yeah, man. So. Uh, it's important, you know, that, again, as we were started in the beginning, that you know, you don't have to be a Bible scholar, but it's important that you're able to keep the resurrection the center of your conversation. Uh, and it's important, too, that you know uh, something about your faith. Not only that you've accepted Christ as your Savior, which is the most important thing. But you also have to know that Christ is your Savior. He's your Lord. He's your King. And you got to understand, this is why I stand upon the rock of Jesus. You know, um, this is why I stand on the rock of Jesus. You know, um, because there are a million, as I've probably covered, I don't know, probably five tonight. I mean, there's millions of different philosophies. I mean, there's, I would almost bet that you could go down this hallway and if you sat down and talked to ten different people, they all, of course, came from ten different backgrounds. And they all have 10 different ideas of who Jesus is. Yeah, they come to church here. And they've accepted Christ as their Savior. But like all of us, and like Thomas, he says, what? I believe, but help my doubt. Help me. Help me understand. 
I mean, that should be all of our, all of our, it should be my prayer, and it is every day. God, I don't get it. I don't get it. I'm, I'm just going to be flat out transparent. You know, when I'm reading the scriptures, when I'm sharing the gospel, you know, when I'm talking to other people, I'm like, what in the world? What in the world? How do you, how do you, how do you cut through that? What do you what do you what do you what do you cut through that? What do you cut through it with? Because when you try it with scripture, I mean Jesus tried it with scripture and they crucified him. Right? So me as a mere human being, I I, I I'm not ashamed to say that, you know, I struggle with it. You know what I'm saying? Now, I do, I do. I don't understand it all. I can understand some of it, but I don't understand it all. I wish that I could bring, like Paul says, all of you to Christ. But I can't. I can't. You know, but I wish that somehow that you, as Christ walks alongside of you, that you would allow him to pierce your soul and let his spirit inside your heart. That's, 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 a, that's a heavy prayer, man. Because, you know, all of us have walked, have walked that walk. And Christ has walked beside us, calling us, yet we don't even allow him into our lives. You know? It's kind of like, I know you're there, but let me go ahead and do what I need to do. And then I'll come back and get you later. He said, well, you know, I'll be here when you're ready. Hope you don't fall and hurt yourself before that. But, um, but yeah, man, so don't be ashamed. Paul, man, wasn't ashamed of the gospel. Even though he says, I'm one of the least of these, I'm still going to share the gospel. Share the gospel and don't forget the resurrection. So we'll go ahead and um, end on that. No, we'll do uh, part two. We'll talk about uh, the church at Thessalon Thessalonica next week. But I want to make sure that we make sure that uh, the resurrection being the most important thing we talk about today. Anybody got any questions? If not, we'll pray any special prayer requests. Praise God. Man. Let's do it. So God, thank you so much for this evening, Father. I pray that um, the men were um, blessed by your words, Father. I pray that I didn't get in the way. God, and I thank you again for your son, Jesus, who uh, graciously died on the cross for my sins, Father. And I'm not worthy of that gift, dear God. But you love me. You love these men more than we can ever imagine. That you stepped down out of your time, Father, and to save us. And you gave us these words of encouragement, Father, that we can follow you. That we can lead other people, Father. No matter their race, no matter their color, Father, no matter their background. That your word can penetrate through anything, God. Through marrow. Home, you can do it all. So God, we ask that you would just fill us afresh with your spirit, fill us afresh with your word, Father, and help us to uh, have a desire to just uh, grow closer to you through your word, Father. Not just in some sort of mental exercise, God, but literally, really draw nearer and closer to you. So, Father, we thank you again for this opportunity. We thank you for your love. Thank you for the Son, Jesus, that we died on the cross for our sins. In Jesus' name I pray. Everybody say it. Amen. Amen.